I want to kick us off because we have an important matter today. We have a brand new book to talk about. Um, I am Will Fenton, Director of Scholarly Innovation at the Library Company of Philadelphia. I suspect that many of you know about the Library Company, but I'm going to tell you about it just the same. We were a library founded by Benjamin Franklin, 1731, very much set the mold for the lending libraries that um, uh, subscription-based lending libraries that circulated across America. And uh, today we're a research library. We have all sorts of terrific research fellows that come through. We have about 50 to 60 fellows a year, actually, which is a lot for an institution our size. And um, they have very generously agreed to help us sustain our programming uh, while we're all remote and scattered, you know, back home and, you know, elsewhere. Um, and this series is our online program that we're maintaining right now, which is called Fireside Chats. Fireside Chats being, you know, quick, hour-long explorations of fellows' research. Sometimes it's a work in progress, sometimes it's a journal article, sometimes it's a digital humanities project, uh, but more often than not, it's about books, brand new books that uh, our fellows have produced. And today we're gonna hear about not just any old book, but a book that was actually just made available today. Uh, I can't imagine more fortuitous timing. So I'll be dropping a link in there uh, because we actually have a coupon code for 30% off from the publisher, which um, Lucas has generously passed along to us. A uh, quick thing about this whole interface, this is Zoom. I know it's a, uh, you know, like something we're all familiar with. This is a slightly different permutation of Zoom because you don't see all of your faces right now. It's just really Lucas and myself and I'll dip out for a bit as well. And the whole idea behind this is that you don't have to worry about having your hair perfect and you can put your feet up and relax. No more Zoom fatigue. We really want you to be able to sit back and enjoy this conversation. Uh, but we also want you to participate in it. And you can participate through the Q&A button. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. I encourage you as you're listening to what I'm sure is gonna be an amazing talk, if you hear something that you're interested in that you wanna hear more about, uh, write it in Q&A before you forget it. And then I will do my best to get to everyone's questions. I'll try to work through them sequentially. So the sooner you get your question in, the more you're guaranteed that I will get to it. Um, the other thing about this, uh, Zoom automatically records this. We'll do a very light edit, and then we'll put it up on our SoundCloud feed, which goes out to our podcast, and also up onto our YouTube channel, which means that if you are really excited about this and you want other, other people to know about it, uh, you'll have a link that you could pass around. So we'll be following up with session notes within the next five, six, seven days. Uh, so with that, um, I want to dive right into this. Uh, I am joined today by uh, Dr. Lucas A. Dietrich, uh, who is an adjunct professor of humanities at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is a council member and former president of the New England American Studies Association and the recipient of a Northeast Modern Language Association Fellowship at the Newberry Library and a Director's Scholarship at the Rare Book School. Excellent. Dr. Dietrich has published articles in multi-ethnic literature of the United States, book history, and papers of Bibliographic Society of America. His book, which we'll be hearing about today, Writing Across the Color Line, U.S. Print Culture and the Rise of Ethnic Literature, has just been released by the University of Massachusetts Press. Again, just today. <laughs> what a get. Uh, Dr. Dietrich, was a, uh, an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellow at the Library Company in 2016. We're very proud of that. Thank you for joining us, Lucas. Thanks so much, Will. I'm really excited to be here. Let me get my screen share up. Is that working for everyone? I think it should be. Um, thanks for that introduction, Will. I'm, I'm so excited to be speaking uh, here with you all. Uh, and, you know, the Library Company of Philadelphia is such a great place to do research. Um, and my time there in the summer of 2016 was so productive for this project. So um, here's, the, here's the book. Uh, as Will said, it just, was just made available on the UMass Press website today. Um, and I think he's sharing a, a discount code. I wanted to draw attention to start to the, uh, the subtitle of the book, U.S. Print Culture and the Rise of Ethnic Literature from 1877 to 1920. Um, and this is one way to think about uh, my interest here is um, I'm trying to consider how multi-ethnic literature 
literature written by diverse authors um, was becoming increasingly significant in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century. And I'm trying to recover the history of um, how that literature was produced um, and distributed and marketed and things like this. This is a, a list of some of the authors of color who were publishing in this era. And, um, you know, depending on your interests in American literature, these are more or less familiar. I think, you know, the most familiar would certainly be W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, but, but just one thing to note here is that, um, you know, we have a pretty large constellation of multi-ethnic authors who are publishing literature at this time. And, um, of course, writers of color were producing work, uh, fiction, poetry, prose, journalism, uh, throughout early American history. Uh, but one of the things that's new about this era in the late 19th century is that these authors were producing work that was being uh, published by major commercial trade presses. So they actually um, sought and won over the support of these major presses so that their work could be um, produced in quality editions, distributed nationally, um, and read widely. And so oftentimes these authors are really seeking out that sort of national audience and they're trying to, um, to reach a sort of like quote unquote mainstream uh, white readership in order to influence them. Um, and so again, this was, this is sort of what is driving the project for me. A number of scholars and critics have <clears throat> talked about the stylistic techniques that these authors um, used in order to sort of enter this uh, mainstream literary marketplace or the commercial literary marketplace. Um, and so these are techniques like dialect writing was incredibly popular at the time. There was like this fad for writing with this like thick dialect and accents. Um, and so sometimes the literature written in dialect is very difficult to follow. It's almost like if someone was writing in the language of like text, um, uh, text messages today. Um, or regionalism, like highlighting the local color of being a New Englander or a Southerner or a Midwesterner, which felt very important as the United States nation's like boundaries were expanding and solidifying. Um, this was an era, era of literary realism. It was an era of caricature at the same time. And so these uh, um, ethnic authors, they sort of saw an opportunity in this that, well, um, my culture is being sort of represented and caricatured by other writers, by white writers. I can sort of take on that style and subvert it. And I can, I can get published and I can try to get people to listen to me that way. And so um, they sort of took on these styles in a subversive way and reappropriated them in order to try to reach a wider audience. Um, and again, this is something that has, has been sort of discussed in the scholarship. One thing that um, interests me again was then how was this work produced? What was the relationship like with editors um, and things like that. So this is one way to think about my sort of approach in my research and my sort of methodology. This is a, um, a graphic from Robert Darton's What is the History of Books? And this is something he calls the communication circuit. And the idea here is that essentially, you know, books move through a circuit. There's an author who's creating the work and they need to link up with a publisher, someone to produce it. Um, and so it sort of moves around this circle toward the printers and suppliers and is distributed to booksellers and then it goes to readers. And he gives this sort of dash line that goes from the readers back to the author. And part of the idea there is that when readers review the work, the author is often aware of those reviews and those criticisms and the author may take that criticism and, and think about that when they produce a new work of literature and when they're publishing their next work. And meanwhile, you have these sort of circles in the middle of the graph, and these are showing the sort of economic and social pressures, right? So at every step along the way, there, these are social interactions, there's money um, changing hands. Um, and so those are impacting every, every aspect of this like communication circuit. 
Uh, and those especially come to the foreground when we're dealing with, with racial issues of racial inequality and, and, and oppression. So when I put all that together, this slide really is talking about sort of my findings with the project, the circulation and reception of this literature. So we have these authors of color and really for the first time in American history, they're able to write for a national audience and target for a national audience and have their work widely distributed. They're connecting with publishers who are supporting them. And um, again, this is not happening all the time. It's not as if all publishers are trying to support this work, but some publishers are supporting it. And one of the more surprising findings for me in my research was that the, when the publishers do support this work, they support it quite actively. They want it to succeed. And they're really, in, they're invested in these authors and they do a good job with the, the production and the marketing. Um, so that was one of my major findings is the relationship with the publishers is actually quite strong. Um, and what ends up sort of uh, cutting this literature short so that it's not as successful and so that we haven't heard of these authors in the same way that we've heard of um, Langston Hughes or author writers of the Harlem Renaissance or something like that is um, the readership and the reviews and the criticism that they faced. So I, I sort of outlined a, a two-step process among mainstream white readers and, and the first the first response to this work is that it's often misread. And so if these authors try to use self caricature or dialect and then um, subvert that literature to kind of use it and, and go in a different direction with it, a lot of the readers just miss that completely. They don't notice it, they don't see the irony. And the literature is then read as sort of reinforcing the stereotypes. But the other reaction that we see very commonly is that if the book is understood, Right? If it is understood to be sort of criticizing race relations in the United States or criticizing white supremacism, then uh, the books tend to be really harshly rejected and criticized. And, um, and this is a sort of like a backlash, right? There's this sort of backlash that um, this is too political. It's not even literature. It's below the dignity and status of literature. Um, and, so, and so this reaction among the, within the commercial literary marketplace um, actually sort of uh, cuts short publisher support. And it's not until later on in the 20th century that we see that support sort of reemerge. Um, and then one final step that I try to draw attention to is that um, despite that criticism and despite the fact that a lot of this writing was rejected in the literary marketplace, um, in the contemporary literary marketplace, that there was this sort of long-term influence and, and the the books themselves survived. They were widely distributed. And a lot of later authors, artists, intellectuals, and even the mainstream public starts to pick the books back up again. And so one thing I end up highlighting is the fact that even through the process of being rejected and the process of being criticized is that these authors laid the framework for a sort of multi-ethnic um, 20th century American culture. And, um, and that they really laid the foundation for a lot of the multi-ethnic literature we see uh, later on. So what I'm going to do for the, for the rest of the talk is I'm going to talk about two examples from the book. Um, and they're from the first two chapters, uh, chapters one and chapter two. And the first is going to be a, a Californian Mexican American writer. And the second is going to be an African American writer. So this is Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton. She's, uh, I think she's best described as a Californian writer. Um, but California at the time that she was born was Mexican territory. And she was born into uh, a wealthy landowning family in Baja, California. And so, uh, so she was raised within a sort of European Spanish um, culture of letters. She was well educated. Um, but as she came of age, the, the U.S. had went to war with Mexico. The Mexican-American War was happening from 1846 to 1848. And, um, and so as she turned 17 and the Mexican-American War um, was concluding and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, 
um, she actually had to travel to north in California as a refugee and became an American citizen. Um, she ended up marrying an army uh, general. He was initially a captain when they got married. His name was Henry S. Burton. And so that's why her name is this sort of hybrid name, Ruiz de Burton. So she was a Spanish Catholic, California Catholic, and he was Protestant um, army captain and became a general. And they were married and she traveled east with him when he, uh, he fought in the Civil War in the Union Army. And so she lived later on in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, in New York. Um, in 1869, after the Civil War, her husband died and she was widowed. And so she traveled back to California uh, with their two children. And she spent most of the rest of her life um, fighting to try legal battles to try to get her land back because her land was stolen in the process of the, the Mexican-American War. She published three um, books in her lifetime, and these are really some of the, the first Mexican-American or Hispanic or Latina um, fiction, books of fiction published in English in the United States. And um, you know, all of those terms are kind of tricky because I think, again, the best way maybe to describe her is Californian. So she had this one novel, Who Would Have Thought It, 1872. She had a play that she published as a book in 1876, and then another novel, The Squatter and the Dawn, in 1885. These books were not exceptionally popular in her lifetime, but they, they were read, they were distributed and read and, and reviewed. Um, they, they've been recovered in the 1990s by scholars, and they're read in, um, in colleges today, especially in graduate classes. So they're probably more widely read today um, than ever before. But the thing that interested me in this uh, list of publications is that the first publication, so this is again, the earliest Mexican American novel in English, it was published by J.B. Lippincott in Philadelphia. And they were, Lippincott was one of the largest publishers and book distributors in the 19th century, um, in the whole world at the time. And so I really wanted to get to the bottom of this. What, like, what was that relationship like? How was she working with that publisher? And so that's why I traveled to, to Philadelphia to do this research. Um, here's just a brief plot summary of the novel, who would have thought it. There's a, there's a Mexican girl named Lola Medina who's, who's kind of the protagonist. There's a, there's a large cast of characters here. But she's in captivity in California and she's rescued by a New England archeologist, Dr. Norval, and he brings her to New England. And she has this massive inheritance of gold and gemstones. And this was you know, around, still kind of around the time of the gold rush, 1849 and the 49ers. So uh, Louise de Burton's kind of playing this up. Dr. Norval brings her back to New England and he tries to protect her. He's like an honest man and tries to take care of her. But he has to travel for another expedition. And while he's away, his wife, his daughters, and even their minister all plot to steal her fortune and take her money away. So there's this issue of like theft and theft of Mexican American property. And the fact that that's coming from these white New Englanders and these white women and they're Christians, they're supposedly abolitionists. There's a really strong criticism here. And then ultimately, Lolda marries Dr. Norval's son, an officer in the Union Army. And so this is very similar to Ruiz de Burton's own life. And at the end of the novel, they move to Mexico and they're reunited with Lola's father. And so here we have the book imagining that there's um, a sort of union of Mexico and the United States that's, um, you know, that's not a battle and not a war, but that there's this union and it's actually recentered in Mexico rather than the United States. Here's the book, um, the library company's copy, and uh, a pretty simple volume, uh, you know, a little bit of gold on the spine. And this would have looked like almost any other book in the Lippincott catalog. Here's the title page. This was published anonymously. So uh, she did not put her name on this book. And then in the back of the copy that's held by the um, library company of Philadelphia, there's advertisements. There's a catalog of Lippincott's other books. So you, it's almost 10 pages of advertisements for their other books. And this is really fascinating to me is that there's this context is that 
the novel itself was meant to fit into this catalog and that it kind of makes sense when you when you start when you start to understand these other novels you have a better sense of of this novel um, I'm going to transition now and talk a little bit about Lippincott as a company and, and then, you know, turn to the relationship with Ruiz de Burton. Uh, this is from an article from 1852, Godey's Ladies Book. Um, and this is a, a relatively well-known image uh, inside the, one of the sales rooms. But this was an article where the, the, the writer C.T. Hinckley had meant to talk about the book bindery of Lippincott. It was called Lippincott and Grambo prior to like a corporate merger. But um, he ends up, he's just so overwhelmed with the massive size of Lippincott as he, as he sees their facilities that he ends up writing a longer, he even says that he ends up writing a longer article than he ex expected to because he wants to talk about how they manage all of these aspects of book manufacturing. Uh, here, this is from 1860s and uh, the image is from 1866. And, this is when the company moved to a new location, Market Street in Philadelphia, the facade of the building. And then in 1871, there's this uh, factory annex built. And so this is the same facade on the front of the building, but the whole factory on the back is, uh, um, is an addition. And, and this is a, from the 1880s Publishers Weekly. And there's actually a little explanation there where it can, it tells you what every single room is doing and you can sort of follow how the books are produced as they go from uh, being printed and folded and stitched and bound and all of this. Um, and so I actually have to say thank you to the, to Jim Green, the librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia, because while I was there on my fellowship talking about this project, he referred me to this image. Um, so I wanted to get behind the scenes of this one. How was this book published? What was the relationship like? And one thing is that the, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, which is right next to the library company, um, holds the archives and, the, and many of the business records of J.B. Lippincott. So at, when I was there, I was working at the library company and the Historical Society. So this is some of the records of the company. This is... Uh, this is what's called a pressed letter book. So this is correspondence between J.B. Lippincott and Ruiz de Burton. And it's almost like a carbon copy, except what they would have done is they would have pressed this like tissue paper, like a tracing paper onto the letter when the ink was still wet. And then they sent the letter and they keep the tissue paper. So this is a, a, like a pressed letter copy of an early letter between her and the publishers. Oh, I need to talk more about this. So you can see that this is actually not in great condition, that it's been sort of water damaged. Um, the one reason that scholars hadn't known much about Ruiz de Burton's relationship to Lippincott is that it was thought that these records were lost. It was thought that they were destroyed by fire. Um, there was a massive fire, I think in 1899, that destroyed a lot of the, a lot of the Lippincott um, warehouse. And, the, the company records that are here at the Historical Society were only donated to the Historical Society in the early 2000s. And it's, it takes some time before they begin to be cataloged and posted on the website. And so not too many people know about these. I found out about them while taking a course at the Rare Book School with Michael Winship. And he, he actually had worked to catalog them. And so when I was in the archives and opening these up and finding these letters, there's, you know, a real sense of like discovery and recovery there as you're, you're looking at these. Here's another letter with her. This is uh, 20 years later, 1894. And you can see they've switched over to a typewriter and, and this is actually a carbon copy. But what I want to emphasize, they've got, you know, 20 years of correspondence with her um, for, for this one book. It's only the one book in 1872. And then this was sort of the most exciting find for me. This is from a ledger, like a, an accounting book. It's, like, it's called a double entry ledger. And this, there's two pages here. But on the first page, um, this shows all the costs of producing this book, that it costs um, $367.50 to manufacture it, that they paid $1 for the copyright. 
that it costs um, $1,015.68 overall, and they produce 750 copies of the book. So I was thrilled when I found this because this, this was something that had not been known about this book. Um, and on this side of the accounting book, again, it's like two pages. One is the sort of costs and one is the, the income, the money that's being made. And so this actually details the sales for the book. Um, how many copies did they sell? Um, they keep records almost every six months in, in, at the end of June and the end of December. Um, and some of these records even show where specific books were distributed. So this was uh, really exciting to see. Um, one of the things I found out was that uh, Ruiz de Burton actually paid Lippincott um, $500 to have the book printed there. So she did not pay the whole $1,015, but she paid Lippincott $500 um, in order to have the book published. And uh, Lippincott describes this throughout their records. They say, we account sales. They have this sort of formula. And it basically, it gives the booksellers a discount. It gives um, Lippincott a certain amount of money. And then another amount of money gets credited to Ruiz de Burton. And so she made back a lot of the money um, for the cost of the book to be produced through sales, but she still had to pay this $500. Um, and so, um, and so the, the book would have been produced here. This factory was built one year before it was published and it would have been printed in this sort of job printing department. Um, again, they have like a separate department to sort of publish books that were, um, that authors would have paid to have produced. So, so in a sense, this idea of like the job printing and the paying is, is a little bit disappointing, right? It's, um, you know, instead of them working or seeking out this novel to publish it, she had to go to them. And we could even ask, is this exploitative, right? Lippincott published a lot of these books, like really small print runs of these books, and they made a lot of money off of it. Um, but the interesting thing is that they, there was a lot of benefit for the authors as well. The book is very well manufactured. It's distributed all across the country. Um, she, she would have owned the copyright if she had just, um, uh, for, for much less than it cost to produce the book. And Lippincott advertised the book. They kept the book in their catalog. They kept the book in their warehouse for almost 30 years. It was always available. They advertised the book in other novels. So in the same way that there was advertisements in the back of Reese de Burton's novel, her book was advertised in the back of other novels. And, um, and one thing that this led me to, to realize was that um, she was really being marketed in the style of these sensational novels. So they, their catalog, they had a lot of novels that were about like, um, you know, ministers having illicit affairs or people having these double identities and hidden lives and secrets. And so she really um, targeted Lippincott because she wanted her book to seem like any one of those novels with this like minister trying to take all this gold from this woman who's been cap captured. And, um, and so she, uh, Ruiz de Burton really wanted to have her book appear alongside these. Um, and so th that's one way that I've come back to understanding the book and the production is that the anonymous production, the fact that it looked like any other title in their catalog was all deliberate on Ruiz de Burton's part. And she wanted um, people who entered bookshops to just pick this off the shelf and think that it was any other sensational novel. And then as they read it, they start to get, oh, well, there's a sort of Mexican American perspective here. And, and the narrator is a time speaking Spanish. Um, and so I think it was really savvy on her part. And um, and I don't want to like underestimate like the impact that that may have had on like, you know, the, the several hundred readers who actually did purchase this book. So I'm going to transition now to my second example. Uh, this is an African American author named Charles Chestnut. This is from chapter two of the book. So, so this is uh, a book called The Conjure Woman. It was published by Houghton Mifflin in 1899. And this is, Houghton Mifflin was a very prestigious publisher at the time. They had published uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, they're the parent company of the Atlantic Monthly, which was, uh, you know, basically the, the 
primary arbiter of literary taste, and of course is still publishing today at The Atlantic. So um, this is their first book of fiction that they published by an African-American author. They published a book of uh, two, I think, two books of poetry by Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, just prior to this. So they're just starting to try to, to um, publish the work of African-American authors at this time. Here is Chestnut himself. Um, and as you can see, he's a very light-skinned African-American. He was like capable of passing as white. And he was often like mistaken as being, for being a white person. And um, he never really actively deceived uh, people. He never chose to pass as white. So he was born, his life has this really interesting span from before the Civil War in 1858 into the 1930s. So, you know, past the stock market crash and through the Harlem Renaissance and through the Roaring Twenties. Um, and so he was born in, in North Carolina and his family was, was uh, free, uh, free people of color. And when the Civil War began in 1861, they, they left, they fled North Carolina to Ohio, Cleveland, and they had family there. And after the Civil War, they returned to North Carolina. They lived in Fayetteville. So Chestnut grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina in, uh, during Reconstruction. And he really benefited from all the amendments and the acts that were happening in Reconstruction after the Civil War. He got a very good um, education in the uh, Freedmen schools, you know, these segregated schools. And he became a teacher and a principal. Um, but then as Reconstruction starts to come to an end in the 1890s and Plessy versus Ferguson and Jim Crow is on the rise, he's feeling less and less safe. And he's married and he has a, a daughter. And so he leaves again um, to Cleveland, Ohio. And he lives in Cleveland again for the rest of his life until 1932. Um, he was a lawyer, he got his law degree, and he ended up, rather than practicing law, he started up a stenography business, a court transcript business. And it was, it was quite successful. But meanwhile, even as he did that, he wrote literature from the early 1880s uh, all the way until his death. And so he was, he, his writing career spans like 50 years, um, but he's most active in the, in the years right around the turn of the century from about 1899 to, to 1905. And from 1899 to 1901, he publishes four books with Houghton Mifflin. And that's the only point in his career where he's really trying to make it as an author. And then he kind of realizes like, I can't support my family this way. Um, so he goes on to, to open his stenography business. And, and just one other thing to note here is how his life is guided by these major historical events. Like you can see how the, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, all have like a very direct impact on his, on his life as he, he literally moves uh, from state to state in, in order to sort of survive. Um, this first book is, is really marketed in the style of plantation fiction. And uh, I can go more into this in Q&A, and I do in the book, but basically the, um, the sort of Br'er Rabbit stories and these Uncle Remus stories. Um, so there were all these stories about Br'er Rabbit, you know, told by Uncle Remus, who was like a, a former slave. And these, these stories really like softened the violence of slavery. They, they kind of made it seem like things were not so bad on the plantation or under slavery. And Br'er Rabbit himself is this character who's always sort of threatened, but nothing bad ever happens. And so there's this idea that the black storyteller and Br'er Rabbit sort of had it okay um, in the antebellum era. Um, Chestnut stories have a, a much harsher critique of slavery. Um, they, they follow the format of Uncle Remus with this sort of black storyteller telling these old stories, but the stories have a much darker tone to them if you read for it. Um, and one thing that's interesting about the marketing of The Conjure Woman is that the, the bunny rabbits here on the cover, there are no bunny rabbits in the book. The, I think there's one rabbit mentioned at one time in one of the stories briefly. Um, but they clearly tried to market this um, in terms of Br'er Rabbit to show like you're going to get this style of plantation fiction. And again, so he's trying to sort of subvert and, and reappropriate the genre. Um, and so I wanted to sort of, again, I wanted to get into the records behind the scenes and find out what's going on with this. Um, 
these are the these are ledgers very similar to what I've shown with Ruiz de Burton. These are the Houghton Mifflin Company records. Um, this is for one of Chestnut's later novels called The Marrow of Tradition. And so these records at Houghton Mifflin at the Harvard Library are extensive. They are very well preserved. They're an incredible resource for a study of uh, 19th century American literature. And what they show is that Houghton Mifflin was very supportive. They, by the, by the time Chestnut is publishing his fourth book with them. They spend, um, and you can almost see it here, it says advertising to date, $1,357. So they spent over $1,300 to advertise this book. And that was a lot of money at the time. It was one of their headlining novels. And it was, it was not well received. And that sort of spelled the end of, of Chestnut's career, at least with, within Houghton Mifflin. But while he was with them, they were very supportive. Here's an advertisement. And again, these are from these same archives at Harvard Library. And you can see this is a little leaflet. They have these little, it's ephemera, right? It's ephemeral. And it's a little leaflet and with, with Chestnut. And you can see they're, they're kind of trying to pass him off. They're trying, you know, he looks like, um, you know, any other white author. And so it looks like this is, you know, these are, this is plantation fiction in the same style as Uncle Remus. And when you open this leaflet up, it opens up. And they've got these blurbs. They've got quotes from the book reviews. These are all quotations from reviews of The Conjure Woman. And one thing you find here is that none of the critics recognize the darker, more subversive element of these stories. They're not seeing that Chestnut is, is painting a much more brutal uh, picture of what life was like in slavery. And they're just reading it as plantation fiction. And, and Chestnut was actually okay with this for his initial book. He kind of, you know, he wanted to get it distributed and out there. But when he realized, when he started to realize that no one was, was understanding this, he, he really did change his literary style. And he starts to be more open and, and upfront about his, his criticisms of race relations in the US. Um, there, was a, there was a limited edition, a special edition of the book that, that doesn't get talked about very much. And Chestnut describes it like this. It was, um, there was 150 copies printed and they were sold to the Rofant Club, which was a, um, a literary book club in Cleveland, Ohio, that's still active today. And Chestnut was rejected membership at the club all, explicitly on racial grounds in the early 1900s. But a decade later, they accepted him and he actually joined and, and attended meetings and gave talks there. But this limited edition was printed by the Riverside Press, which is affiliated with Houghton Mifflin, on handmade linen paper bound in yellow buckram with the name on the back in black letters on a white label, a very handsome and dignified volume. And so here it is. This is the copy at Harvard. And so you can see it's got this cover. It doesn't have that caricatured image. It's a larger edition. It's got linen paper that's watermarked. It's got big margins that you could write in if you wanted to respond. Um, but there was one twist when I found this book and when I looked at it at Harvard University is that it was bound with uncut, unopened pages. So um, what that basically means is, is the book would be printed on large sheets, right? And they would print eight different pages and then it gets folded up and stitched together. And usually the publishers, you know, cut the edges so that you can read each leaf. Um, but, and this happens with these types of special editions, numbered editions for a book club. This was produced uncut. And um, this, the uncut process actually gets mentioned in The Great Gatsby. I don't know if people are familiar with this, but there's one scene where one of the partiers at Gatsby's mansion, who's described as owl eyes, is saying that the books at Gatsby's mansion um, they're not fake. They're not cardboard. They're real. And they're so rare that they actually are uncut. And so the uncut book is like a marker of class and dignity and status. But it's also a marker of Gatsby's sort of thin veneer of, of culture because he hasn't read the books. And so one thing that I want to highlight here is that, you know, Chestnut, this is this sort of difficult dynamic for an African American author at this time is on the one hand, well, I, I, um, have this caricatured thing that's read as if it's plantation fiction with this sort of stereotyped image on the cover. On the other hand, I get this really nice treatment in a special edition 
but it's unopened and it's not being read. I can't even be sure that it's being read. And um, Chestnut, he, um, after his brief period of time publishing these four books with Houghton Mifflin, his last interaction with them was he published a story in the Atlantic Monthly in 1904, in June 1904, called Baxter's Procrustes. And this short story, it's about a book club that is so caught up with the outside of books and how good quality they are and how good the binding is that they don't care about the content, right? They, they're just, you know, they're judging the book by its cover, you know, so to speak. And, and there's this character, Baxter, and he's a trickster character, and he tricks the club into spending um, huge amounts of money on a book that is, is, it's in a wrapper, but the pages are actually unprinted and the pages are blank. And so this is Chestnut's last publication within this uh, sphere of elite literary culture. And he kind of finds this way to, to criticize that culture itself and to say, um, you know, my work, you know, my work wasn't really received the way it was here. And what is this culture if we're not engaging? Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to end on a slightly uh, more upbeat note, a slightly more positive note with my uh, last image here. And this is the copy of the special edition of The, Conj of the Conjure Woman that's held by the library company in Philadelphia. So when I was doing this research, I was able to look at a few different copies of that book in different locations. And the copy at the library company um, is, is actually opened. So somewhere along the line, someone, someone cut the pages and so that they could read it. And um, they actually, when they went around cutting the edges of the paper to open it, they used a pen. And so as I was looking at the book at the library company, you can see these pen, these spots of pen and ink along the edges every now and then from when they had cut it open. And um, to me, this is just a great symbol of um, the, the work that these authors and these writers deserved, right, was to open up the work, to engage with it, to listen to the type of critique they're actually doing, and to have that um, influence the, the writing and the thinking that we do, right? And so to me, that's, that's one way that I, I've sort of thought about the project, was trying to engage with this work, trying to give it the attention that, that it deserves. These are really rich texts, um, and to allow that to sort of influence our thinking. Um, and so I'll end my talk there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, as soon as people have a second to look at that last slide, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can go back into a more conversational mode as we turn back to uh, questions. And I see that we already have a few. Sure. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll exit out of this. And thank you again for um, allowing us to be your first book talk. Um, I feel really privileged. Yeah. Um, so this is great, and I and I and I have a question to get us started here because I do want to I give. I do want to give. I'd like to give. I'd like to give. Hold on. Is my audio disruptive on your end? I'm hearing it. Okay. Excellent. All right. It's probably just an errata with my computer, which is sometimes fussy. All right, sorry about that. Uh, so quick question to kick us off while folks submit their questions. Um, particularly when you're talking about Chestnut, you were talking about all of these different sort of um, clues that sort of anticipate an audience. Um, you have uh, the leaflet that presents uh, a sort of Chestnut who's passing as white that circulates. Then you have um, the sort of aesthetics of the actual publication, that, that, that Houghton edition with the um, margins that are large enough for annotations and the linen paper. Um, when, when we're situating a text in that larger context of that publishing machinery, that you have that beautiful graphic anticipating all that social work that happens around publishing, how do you go about disentangling the intentions of the author from the intentions of the publisher? Because I know that you said at the top that these writers are trying to address a national audience and to influence them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there is anything that sort of gives that away or if that's something that maybe gets mixed up in some complicated ways with the marketability and saleability that publishers are seeking. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I mean, it's this question of uh, the intentions of the text there, the intentions of the, you know, that, uh, 
you know, the, there's this like the fallacy of intentionality or something. But, um, you know, I think one thing that guided me was the, the interaction with the publisher. So there are examples of these authors. Sutton E. Griggs is an African-American author working out of Texas. He's self-publishing his work. And so he, you know, did not want to deal with the publishers and have their work, you know, their, you know, editorial apparatus like affecting his writing. Right. And so there are, there are authors working in different modes. Uh, another way to think about it is correspondence and, and journals. I mean, Chestnut in his journals, he says, um, my aim is not to elevate African American people. My aim is to elevate white people. Like they're the ones who are degenerate. And you can see in his letters that he's trying to do this. And then you can see that he's, he becomes frustrated with the way his work's being read. And so, you know, you, you could read the literature differently. You could say that the, the audience isn't misreading because there's like, it's so written in the genre of plantation fiction that the audience isn't necessarily misreading, but his intentions are pretty clear with all of that sort of um, context and, and some of that correspondence. Um, and so, so again, the thing that sort of al allows me to sort of compare these authors is that you can see that they're they're after the same thing. They're trying to they're trying to reach white readers. They're trying to reach across the color line. They're trying to give a little bit, and um, but they're trying to to sort of get get those readers to think differently. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's not it's not that every you know African American author is doing this, but but Chestnut certainly is. So as we're thinking about connections between the authors, we actually have a great question that picks up right on that. The very first question, I love our audience. They're always a step ahead of us. Uh, it's a methodological question from Vincent uh, de Girolamo. I hope I didn't totally butcher that last name. Uh, he asks, why, why categorize Helen Hunt Jackson and Abraham Kahan as authors of color? What is your criteria? And did Italian Americans, for example, come up in your research? Yeah. No, it's a really good question, and it's something that I've really struggled with, is when you start to make these comparisons, is how do you justify a comparison between the African-American community and indigenous community, and then, um, you know, like white ethnic cultures? Um, I, I do think about this. My, my third chapter in the book is about an Irish-American author, Finley Peter Dunn, who's writing journalism. And so he becomes a sort of test case for thinking about the the white ethnic. And he becomes a test case for thinking about Italian Americans or Irish Americans and how they're sort of socially discriminated against, but they don't deal with the same levels of like oppression. Um, and then meanwhile, there are other interesting connections in my, in my fourth chapter, there's um, the, the, a publishing company out of Chicago that publishes W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk. They are also publishing the first books of Chinese American fiction, Sui Sin Far, and they're also publishing the first books of Jewish American fiction by Emma Wolf. And so I don't really go into Emma Wolf that much. Um, you know, she gets like a paragraph and a footnote to some other people who are doing really great work on her, uh, Lori Harrison Kahan and uh, Barbara Cantalupa. But there's, th there's this interesting thing where like the publisher is actually making this effort and making this connection and trying to market that. So I, I realize that these comparisons are not simple, that, that even like the phrase people of color is vexed and fraught, but I think the, the comparisons are there. And, and I think um, when the authors are in a similar position, it's, it's worthwhile to examine those comparisons. Um, and it actually highlights the distinctions and the differences as well. That's great. So we have a question from uh, Nicole Dressler, a uh, former fellow as well. She thanks you for a fabulous talk and asks, um, there was a rich example that was published anonymously. And I'm curious to know to what extent uh, did authors want to remain uh, anonymous? Did this affect their readership in any way? Yeah, so like one thing that almost became more of a focus in the book than I had initially expected was this idea of like the authorial persona. Mm -hmm. And the, um, I'm trying to think that, you know, again, Finley Peter Dunn early on, he wanted to remain anonymous because he didn't want people to know that his, his satire was like, it was meant to be political. And, um, and Chestnut early on, he kind of plays with passing as white or he allows the text to sort of pass. 
Um, but there are, there are these other things that are sort of adjacent to, to anonymity that really interest me, like pseudonymity. And um, so Ruiz de Burton, she oftentimes went as like Maria Burton in correspondence with people. And then, um, so she has this name, even in the archives that I showed, she gets called like Maria Burton in the letters. But now that her recovery, we sort of call her like Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, Sui Sin Far, who I look at, she's a Chinese American writer who I look at in my final chapter. She was born as Edith Eaton and she's, uh, her father was a white English merchant who married a, a Chinese woman. And she sort of took on this name Sui Sin Far that she took on a bunch of different pseudonyms. And then she sort of kind of became Sui Sin Far. She kind of created this persona for herself. And, um, and her, meanwhile, her sister, um, uh, Winifred Eaton, uh, took on a Japanese persona. They were, they were Chinese, they were like Chinese Canadian North Americans by way of England. And so Edith, Edith Eaton really emphasized her Chinese identity and her sister kind of went in a different direction and played out like a Japanese identity. And so all of these things, they were just like the authors and the publishers were incredibly aware of how this would influence the audience. Mm -hmm. and, in, in, and again, one of the things that surprised me was how supportive the publishers are, is that the publishers are, are in on this and they're trying to work with the authors. And, and at this time, you know, it, it doesn't really work out as they expect. Like they don't, they don't get a wide audience. They don't get the reading they're hoping for in, in almost any of the cases. Um, but they are, they're very aware of how they can use their authorial persona to try to influence that, that reception. So we have a question that actually dovetails nicely with this from Kyle Roberts. He commends you for such a great topic. Uh, seems to be a consensus there. And he says, I wonder if you could talk about the pre-story of publishing authors of colors before national publishers decided to start publishing them. He asked because he's interested in the impact of the choice to go with a white national publisher on non-white audiences. Um, in choosing to go with national white publishers, are authors of color seen as turning their back on non-white readers and community-based publishers? Yeah, so I mean, um, so certainly there's like, um, you know, there's the, the Af um, let me think, there's the, like the Cherokee Phoenix uh, coming out of Georgia is the, the sort of Cherokee newspaper. There's um, the, um, is it the, I don't know the name. There's the um, African American Review. Is that um, so? There, there are a lot of examples of these sort of like early periodicals being published um, within like African American or within like indigenous communities. Um, but one thing is that they don't. They tend not to survive for very long. You tend to get these things that where there's like three issues or five issues because it it takes a lot of money to to establish a publication. Um, and so, so one thing that these authors sort of sought was the, the, the imprimatur, the reputation, the, the marketing revenue, the like distribution channels of these major publishers. Um, and again, none of that is to, to take away from the, the earlier examples or different examples of someone like Sutton Briggs who's self-publishing um, or someone like, like Ida B. Wells or, or, um, or Iola Leroy uh, and, and Francis Harper's work, um, those are all sort of a different publication model. And, and I, there's a lot of interesting work being done on this right now. I mean, um, you can look at, um, especially uh, Derek Spire's recent book, The Practice of Citizenship, where he's looking at uh, early African-American print culture. And I've kind of toyed with the idea of a second project, like moving more in that direction. Um, but for me, what I wanted to look at was Again, part of it was like, uh, you know, what happens when you have this cross-racial dynamic, this cross-racial tension, and, and what is white people's role in this? Are white people ever being supportive? Um, what are white readers doing, and how is that affecting it, right? And so a lot of the authors I examined, they're, they're getting, they're, they're deeply involved in, um, in like these like niche print cultures or, or in the print cultures of their own like communities. Um, but they also want to target um, mainstream, you know, white America and mainstream culture. And, um, and, and, and a lot of them, they, they come into the commercial trade 
uh, industry and then they leave it. And, and when their work's rejected, they sort of return to their own communities and work there. And so one thing you see with Chestnut in his later career is, um, you know, he's publishing in the crisis. He's publishing short stories in the crisis. He's writing about the Harlem Renaissance and things like this. And he's, and he sort of like leaves the, the commercial trade industry. Um, and, and, and he's sort of, you know, he's not thrilled with the way it treated him. Incidentally, for any of you who are interested in that book by Aspires, The Practice of Citizenship, I dropped a link into um, our chat feed. There's lots of stuff in our chat feed, but remember, if you scroll to the very top, you'll have access to uh, pick up a copy of this book with that discount code. I've, couple, I've got a couple more questions I want to try to squeeze in here before we adjourn here. Uh, first from uh, Katie Bicknell, who says, wonderful, Lucas. I especially love the individual stories that bring to life how the authors work to reach across the color line. Do you have any information on how much these authors were able to influence the opinions of their time? Well, um, you know, in most of the chapters, I really go into more of the reception and the review. And I, and I try to find as many of the contemporary reviews as possible. And, and I'm looking at those and I'm trying to notice like trends or patterns in the reviews. Um, but then at the same time, there's, um, there's this question of like influence and like wider impact beyond their own times. Um, the, I mean, the question of impact is really difficult. It's like this, this idea of like reading is so mysterious and trying to gauge reception is like, well, how many, does it mean how many people bought the book? Does it mean how many people read it? Does it mean how widely it was reviewed um, or how many editions it went through? And so there are a lot of different ways to think about reception. Um, and again, I think that the, the best way that I can talk about the dynamic I'm outlining is that within um, the commercial literary marketplace, which is predominantly white, this work gets rejected. And it gets rejected on these sort of two terms. Is, is one, it sort of is seen as stereotypically. And then on the other hand, um, it's sort of more harshly rejected. But, but the books do survive and they have a, a really strong impact on later authors. Um, and so I try to, you know, I, I think you, you have to read the book, but there, there's going to be uh, like more significant discussion of those reviews and that reception um, in each case. All right. So I'm afraid we'll probably only get to one last question. I'm sorry, Jan, we won't get to yours, uh, but um, I trust that you can get in touch with Lucas. Um, Gene Wolfe asks, did your research show up any Native American authors published by American presses of that time? So um, I, I opened the book on, on page one with uh, Zikala Shah, and she publishes three autobiographical stories with the Atlantic Monthly, January, February, March of 1900. And it's, um, it's autobiographical stories of her life, of being, um, being taken from her community and being like sort of converted and brought to an Indian boarding school and then becoming a teacher there. and. Um, and this is really significant to me because, again, it's the Atlantic Monthly. It's this high culture. There was an, a new editor at the time, and he chose to put these, this uh, trilogy of essays in the first three issues of the new century. Um, and so, actually, I, I choose to start the book, uh, my introduction, with that example because in a very short span, it, sh it shows this dynamic and, and how all of these different um, readings can be done of that text where you can actually think that she was – happy being abducted and converted. It's like, it's so ambiguous that it actually leaves that possibility open and readers understand it that way. But then meanwhile, um, the Indian boarding school was so so upset with Zikala Shah that they they had a falling out because of it. And so you can, you can see the dynamic at play. Um, I, don't, I don't go very far into many other indigenous Native American writers, but that is one example that I, that I open with. Well, it is always a pleasure to have another lit scholar on this program and um, I couldn't be more excited about this book. It just sounds amazing. And I'm delighted that we were able to serve as your first platform for this. So thank you so much for joining us, Lucas. Thanks so much, Phil. It was my pleasure. And uh, looking ahead to next week, got these every week. Uh, Steve Bullock is gonna be talking about how Parson Weems remade George Washington and made the 19th century. Same time, same place. Hope you'll join us. Thank you all.